Please remember the the uh, that has been updated now. It's 16 uh, and 17 with an aerial device. We're going to deploy an aerial with every single uh, fire response that we go to. So this particular area that we're talking about, uh, where Station Four would be going, covers Pleasant Valley. And if any of y'all been out to that neighborhood, it is blowing up. Uh, just the growth out there, Barkley Meadows is as well. It used to be a couple streets, now it's expanding. Uh, this would include parts of Cherry Blossom, Cherry Hill. Uh, and as we continue to advance the roads and, and get more development, Old Oxford, Oxford Drive area, all these areas have uh, increased uh, residential growth. Uh, the current population out of the four minute response uh, that Station 4 will address is 3,437 people. This number does not include areas of over, overlap and coverage of Station 2. So when you put a station together, uh, unless you're just completely just very far away, uh, the county stations, they're further away, but it's because of the density of the population. The way that this would be in, there would be some overlap, which is honestly a good thing because you look at the overlap is where your hotels are with Station 2's district. Uh, that would be where the overlap area is, that particular. But this doesn't include any of those people that live in the Station 2 district right now that uh, out of that, that 3,400 number. An important thing to think is, too, is that we're not here just to talk about today. This is about the future as it continues to grow. Obviously, Toyota is out there as well. Uh, with Lexus Way, this would be right there in that same vicinity. Um, 
Toyota does have a fire brigade out there, but Toyota is our responsibility. Uh, whenever Toyota does have any incident out there, uh, we're the ones that respond. We've had several fires out there that have happened inside the plant with uh, different machines. We had that hazmat response that we were out there for a long, long time, and uh, it's very taxing. Uh, we have a good relationship with the Toyota Fire Department, uh, but they're, it's our responsibility to protect that, that area. This is, this is a tough one to look at, but I pulled this right off of Toyota's website. Toyota uh, under roof is 9 million square feet. So, and I know that that's all the buildings encompass, but you have to just think about just the vastness of how big that plant is. It's over 1,300 acres. Um, we have something out there. Obviously, we're going to have to call in a lot of different places, but it, it is our responsibility to take care of that. Another thing that we have too that correlates well with Toyota is the fact that we have the business park. A lot of the places in the business park uh, work directly with Toyota. So if any of these buildings were to be damaged, uh, it could slow down production at Toyota. There's also a lot of different jobs out here. A lot of people have invested a lot of money for this, for this park. And as someone that works for the city and my salary gets paid off tax base, I realize that we need to be able to have taxes coming in to be able to provide fire and be able to provide police, public works, all these different things. So protecting this, uh, this business park is crucial. This overview right here, some of the data is incomplete on it, but it's because some of these properties are not actually <coughs> opened up just yet. But you can see um, <coughs> KCPCS, it's value over $100 million. Um, you look at some of these other properties, look at the number of employees that we have out here working every day, and then look at just the, just the amount of investment that, that we have in this community. And this is right on that outer edge of that four minute response. Uh, going back and looking at Toyota, you know, you're working with nearly 10,000 people in that plant. I know that's not all at one time but they always have people working in that plant. They're always having something going on. And, and I'll discuss this further on in my, in my other slide, but this isn't, uh, you know, we're, we're sitting here talking about, uh, let's not just think about fires, right? EMS is going out there, so we're gonna have EMS there and capable to do if somebody's having a heart attack, these types of things. But they don't do uh, confined space entry. They don't do hazmat calls, they don't do uh, the things that, that we do. And we don't do some of the things that they do. But I think it's important for us to talk about that. Uh, some of the studies that uh, we've been looking at, uh, Lexus Way to US 62, on a daily average, we're looking at almost 12,000 vehicles driving on that road. Uh, I-75 overpass the Champion Way, we're looking at almost 10,000 people, 10,000 vehicles driving on it. So you look at the opportunity for car wrecks, uh, look at the opportunities for that. And NFPA 1710 actually states for EMS calls, which those would fall under, is actually a three minute response. Uh, so we, can, we have to look at it more than just, look at more just fire response. What, the next thing that I wanted to go over was just comprehensive plans. And- Tim, I have a question. Yeah, yes, you, sir. Unless you want me to wait for your- No, sir, go ahead. In, in response to Toyota, do you guys, I'm sure you track how many responses or call responses you've had to Toyota on yes, an sir. annual basis? And I can get you that number. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, wanted to just kind of go over the comprehensive plans, and we're all familiar with what the comprehensive plan is. It's when the community comes together and addresses the needs, not only now, but the future needs of what we will be facing. I wanted to go back, and as far as what they had on the um, Planning Commission's website, it went back to 2006. And 2006, if you look at the second slide of this uh, particular one, they talked about actually building, a, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. They talked about building a fire station uh, on the east side of Toyota, near the business park, and the new subdivision in that area. So this was something that was discussed in 2006. Uh, it also mentions a two, the number two bullet point was talking about increased staffing to meet NFPA 1710 standards for fire department staffing. We actually did that the following year after this. So 2007, we did go to four people per apparatus. It also mentions lower 
ISO rating, uh, we were able to do that. And if you look at the, the bottom one, it was actually talking in 2006 about the fifth fire station. Uh, that would be on the western side uh, where, where the new bypass is now, but at the time they were looking at around the Canewood area around where uh, Great Crossing High School is, but now the <laughs> ideal location would be probably closer to uh, the roundabout down Cardinal Drive and Long Lake, or Long Lick and the bypass. 2011 comprehensive plan, and I'm not going to read these uh, to you, but I just wanted to highlight a couple different things. It talks about uh, sustainable growth, coordinated with public expenditures uh, to provide for adequate facilities. It talks about uh, down here at the bottom, said growth should not exceed the ability of the city county to provide services at acceptable levels of coverage. Uh, it discusses about, you know, just as far as growth and being able to maintain our growth and be able to keep up with it. Uh, talks about the way we're annexing different properties, doing different things. At the very top, it talks about just growth is, is inevitable. And this was in 2011, and it's even more so now. Uh, and, and another thing that it talks about, too, is just being able to uh, anticipate growth patterns, being able to look at where we need to do them, and, and just the cost efficiency of being able to do partnerships with uh, building facilities. And I think that that's something that uh, Brent Setter Carroll is going to be able to discuss that we're doing or wanting to do. Uh, 2017 comprehensive plan it addressed it as well uh, chief Ford had actually mentioned in here about building um, it talks about station four and five in here as well and it's over here on this slide to, the, to my left uh, it talks about adequately staffed equipped police fire emergency services um, so this is something that's been addressed uh, with different people in your all seats and different people in my seat 2022 comprehensive plan says the same thing. Uh, the bottom part says ensure capital improvement plans are effective, cost efficient, cooperative, and complementary. I think that that's something that we're going to be able to show that we're trying to do. But at the very top, it talks about adequately staffed police, fire, emergency services. Then it actually mentions fire protection services uh, constructed in accordance with standards set by NFPA and ISO. Just in, in summary for this first presentation, we're currently out of the NFPA 1710 four minute response for structure <coughs> fires in this area. Uh, stations four and five have been discussed specifically in 2006 and the 2017 comp plan. 2011 and 2022 comprehensive plan discussed not growing out, not outgrowing our service areas. Uh, all discussed the needs to build public facilities to not out outgrow coverage for police, fire, and EMS. Uh, we have not added to our uh, fire protection footprint since 1996. Station 4 coverage area consists of nearly 4,000 citizens outside the four-minute response. This doesn't include Toyota, the people in the business park, or other industry. Again, this is more than fire protection. Car wrecks, confined space, trench, uh, just different rescues that we were <coughs> able to do. Uh, you know, those are concerns of mine. And those fall under the three minute response times for 1710. <coughs> so, does anybody have any questions right now? Yes, ma'am. That nearly 4,000 citizen number, that's existing, currently residing in that service area, not including proposed or approved. Because I know there's, there's already, there's a lot of proposed development out there, but there's approved development too, obviously pending. Yes, ma'am, that's current. Sewer. And that's actually from the 2020 census data. This is coming from Whitley down to planning and zoning. Uh, it's from the 2020 census numbers, and uh, we're a couple years into this decade past already, so those numbers, I'm sure, are up. Since we're out of the NFPA response area, are we on for that, or? No, ma'am. Oh. And I'll get into that in my, previous, in my, in my next slide. So. There's a couple different things that come into factor on that. Your IS, ISO rating uh, can be affected, and, and you'll hear insurance service organization. That is what we base our um, insurance premiums on. So different uh, insurance companies will use ISO. We are, are class two right now. Um, 
So depending upon what your ISO rating is, can go from a one to a ten. One being the better, the closer you are to one, the better it is for your customers and systems. Um, it just basically what it is. We won't be finding it. There's there's departments throughout the country that just do not have the funding to be able to do what they need to do. Uh, it just it doesn't. It's just not as um, as effective. Chief. Yes, ma'am. Um, what's the response time again? for the county to get to this area where we don't have four minute uh, response time, how quickly can the county get there? For to come into our calls? Yeah. That was one of the things again, and that's the thing, some of these will overlap uh -huh. uh, with the different presentations. Depending upon where the call is, you know, it's gonna depend upon when they're, where they're coming. The way that we work is we're gonna try to send the closest uh, county engine to us. Okay. Uh, they're obviously delayed as far as being, they're not well not within that four minute response time uh, but the biggest thing too that I really want to stress out is that and, and I'll kind of put this in the closing is that the county is growing as well right and they're understaffed and the likelihood it's a gamble right it's a gamble that they're not going to be out on something that you're not going to have somebody at, at say there's something that's going to be at um, where they would be sitting, uh, you know, somebody from uh, the station on Cincinnati Park, their station, say they're tied up on a call on interstate on the road. Well, then we're going to have to wait for another station to send something, right? So this is all based on perfect case, perfect scenario that you're going to be able to have that, that engine come to the ladder because we're coming from that particular area. I'll, I'll address some of these in the, in the next thing, and then as we move forward, I'll be able to answer anything that you all have. Uh, Mike Carroll with Mr. Carroll, and I just wanted to, Monica Sumner is going to give a presentation here, but as I was sitting there listening to Chief Thompson, I thought it might be helpful for some of you who haven't been involved to just get a history of how we got from where we how we got to this point in time right now with, with the concept, conceptual design for you to look at. We uh, we were commissioned by the city of Georgetown in June of last year to start planning on fire station four. And we met with uh, the previous chief staff at that point in time. And we, we developed a program for what we felt we needed. And then when uh, Chief Colson resigned, we had a, uh, Chief Thompson brought a different perspective to this. And one of the things that we've done that we've shared with some members of this group is that the overall cost in this thing is down to about a third of what we were looking at last year when we were looking at this, this fire station before. We also had, we are also working on the EMS facility. And so we've been working on that even longer. And we got into discussions and we, we generated, I think, nine or 10 different plans, site plans about whether these buildings could be co-located on site or whether they should be joined together. The ultimate, the, ultimate, the ultimate decision was they needed to be joined together just if nothing else from a cost standpoint because we can share facilities. As Chief Thompson mentioned, he and, he and Chief Ryan are sharing facilities now. They'll be in his facility, he'll be in their facilities, and it's a good cohesive mix of people that are providing different services, but they're still public safety services. So that came to the point where we have, we developed this plan where we have now, where we have them co-joined co together. We have, the, the EMS building is essentially done right now from our standpoint in, in production of construction documents. So what we're waiting on for the EMS is whether the fire station's gonna be done now or somewhere down the road and we'll make accommodations to put those buildings together at some point in the future. So that's that's how we got here. And so I just wanted to give everybody a little bit better understanding about that before Monica gives them their presentation. Any questions on that? Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay, she's getting a call back. Because I need to move that out of your way. No, 
it's not in my way. I just I assumed it was ready to go. So pardon me. Here comes Sarah. <laughs> Looks like it. <clears throat> All right, so I see you have handouts in front of you. You can refer to that uh, for some of the finer text. Uh, I'll work from the screen and try to try to guide you. Um, so you're seeing Lexus Way. Uh, the building is, is a long, narrow building. It faces Lexus Way, runs parallel to it. Uh, it intersects there with uh, Outer Ring Road, um, which is coming in from the top of the page there. Um, the curb cuts which allow us access onto Lexus Way, those are existing. Do we have this? I don't, oh, okay. I I'm sorry, I, th I thought I saw people oh. flipping. Okay. I'm looking. <laughs> All right. You should be able to zoom in though, you see the percentage, the little plus sign next to the percentage at the top of the page there. Yes. We're just going to stay right here, all right? Uh, there you go. So what you're seeing is uh, the orange colored squares uh, represents the shape of the building. Um, as I was saying just a moment ago, the uh, curb cuts or the access points onto Lexus Way are existing. So we uh, designed our site plan to have the roadways on and off the property align with the existing access points, um, that just makes things a lot easier in terms of traffic and uh, transportation issues. So you can see there that across from the Outer Ring Road, there is a, an access point onto the site, uh, and there's also one to the left-hand uh, side of the site or over toward I-75. There's two shades of orange on this uh, site plan that you're seeing. Uh, one has kind of a hatch pattern, or it looks like it's kind of scratched through a darker color, a smaller square that represents the footprint of the fire station in which we're speaking about tonight. The other orange part that is a little brighter in shade is the uh, footprint of the EMS facility. You see there's more parking around the front and side of the EMS facility, and that is for parking for the education component of the building. On the right-hand side across from uh, Outer Ring Road is an access point where the apparatus will be exiting and entering the site. Uh, presumably, they'll, you know, they'll come in uh, to the site, drive around to the back of the building, and be facing out toward Lexus Way. When the doors uh, open, in case of an emergency, they'll exit toward Lexus Way, loop around to the right, and access uh, at the intersection there to get off the property. Okay. Uh, you'll see some dash lines on the light gray pavement. 
um, the, to the left-hand side of the dash lines on the pavement, uh, aligning with the orange or the EMS building there. Uh, that's pavement that's going to be installed as a part of the EMS building. Pavement to the right-hand side of that, which aligns with the darker uh, hatched-in building, which represents the footprint of the fire station. That is pavement that we will add uh, should uh, when and should and when the uh, fire station get constructed, as well as the uh, parking spaces, the uh, 29 parking spaces there that are in place for the fire uh, department. Uh, the access roads to and from Lexus Way will be in place um, with the construction of the EMS. So they're, they're already planned uh, in the initial phase of work. Yes. That could be could delay some response time, just based on the traffic volume going around that circle. You got to consider uh, some type of signage back or lights back down the way that um, alert that fire department or ambulance is being is being dispatched to kind of free up that because that gets congested. <clears throat> do, you, do you have a response? Do you care to say anything? Uh, yeah, we will do. <coughs> I know it does get extremely busy, but with us being able to come out there, uh, just with the the amount of road right here, especially with not having the median right there uh, in the emergency lane, we'll be able to get through there. But it is I, that is a concern, but uh, we'd be able to we'd be able to make it work, especially with signage, making sure we had signs up to the fire department. You know, like you see typically, and I'm sure there's ways that we can work with uh, uh, Kentucky DLT, uh, Ms. Tyke and Mr. Stone we can work with that too with Natalia to be able to get that done too just through a traffic committee okay. so this is a floor plan and due to the size of the facility and the length of it I realize it's it's rather small on your screen Essentially, you'll see the in the orange color, those are the uh, apparatus bays where there'll be um, rescue vehicles and uh, fire trucks. You'll see a dark line uh, where there's three bays to the left of that and two to the right. There's a darkened line down the middle of that orange space. Everything to the left of that darkened line is EMS, and to the right of that is the proposed footprint of the fire station, which shows two um, drive-through bays represented in the orange color. The yellow color uh, are the facilities uh, for the firefighters, for their staff. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that works though, All right. So the, the yellow color uh, to the right of that is the, uh, to the right of that, the, yep, right there. Uh, that's where we have our kitchen and day room and um, laundry facility, sleeping quarters, restrooms, locker rooms, those types of things to support uh, the living quarters uh, for the firefighters. The green area to the north of that is a very small office area. Essentially, it's a captain's office uh, for who's on duty at the time, a small vestibule and a visitor's restroom. You know, you might have a citizen show up here and, and need some assistance with something, install a car seat. There's a variety of reasons why citizens come to the fire station and there's just a small lobby where they can get in, um, speak with someone, get some help, and possibly have a restroom available if they need that. The light blue area to the right of the green right there uh, is a uh, exercise uh, area, uh, and then just a small storage room to support that. Uh, so the quarters are um, modest uh, and really as tight as we could get them and still um, maintain the, the living conditions that the fire fire firefighters need excuse me okay the square footage on on the uh, fire station portion is a little over 6,000 square feet 6,350 and um, mr. Carroll referenced when we started out it was a much larger concept and that concept was uh, 18 and a half thousand 
So it's significantly reduced in just the philosophy of leadership um, and the arrangements between the, the EMS and the fire department. And we did put a schematic design concept together uh, for both buildings combined. Um, the EMS building is already designed and, and well underway. Uh, the station number four is in the foreground uh, for your viewing with the exercise room showing there in the front left corner where the big number four is. Uh, the entrance point to the fire station right by that captain's office is highlighted with a red color right over the door. And then there's two bays for the apparatus just directly to the right of that. And then the rest of the building is all of the um, EMS facility. But we did design the, the whole building, uh, you know, the two pieces of the whole building to coexist and, and look um, like they, they were designed together, which they were. So with that, we can offer questions and discussion and whatever we I can do. I have a question. <clears throat> so looking at the schematic, so the dark gray yes. is the two bays for the fire department? Yes, ma'am. And then to the right, the three bays is EMS? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> I have a question, Tim. How come it went from 18 and a half, 18,000 square feet to 6,000? That That's a huge drop. We just felt that it would be, we could uh, utilize the fact that EMS was moving out there for their headquarters, <coughs> and it would just be a good idea for us to use our EMS downtown, Station 1, to use that as our headquarters uh, for us as opposed to building a new one. Uh, with us being able to utilize Station 1, there's just not the need to be able to build quite the same <coughs> thing as what was originally planned, and we just wanted it to be uh, as cost effective as we possibly could. You know, the, the end goal is for us to be able to get um, protection in that particular area, and and we just try to sharpen our pencils and just try to get it as, you know, as feasible as we possibly could to try to figure out the best compromise by utilizing, uh, narrowing this one down, but then working with EMS so that we could utilize their station for our headquarters. So there's room for a 12 firefighters to sleep? Or eight. I'm sorry. Where is there room for twelve five, five firefighters? Four. four. Just first four. Shift. Okay. First shift. <coughs> Which station? The, the new, new one. Four. For the new station, we are building it uh, in order to be able to house eight. That's what I thought. I was we saying. wanted to be able to build this. We wanted to be modest with the design, but we also wanted to be smart, right? We wanted to be able to know that we are going to continue to grow, and we will eventually want to be able to add a new, uh, you know. Down the line, we're going to be able to add, to add, but as opposed to having to add on, you know, 10 years from now and, and add a new bay and add new quarters and all that, we want to be able to go on and just be done with it. One of the issues that we have now with any of our stations is we've just outgrown them. So we want to be, uh, you know, efficiently, uh, use it as most efficiently in, in the best sense of building for now but preparing for the future. So you're saying that this building can be added on to your site? We can add staffing to it add, and add an apparatus to it without having to then add on to the building. Okay. It's ready to go. It's ready for four people now. It's ready for eight people whenever that happens down the road. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, one, that's okay. I wanted to yeah, we, we're get built, in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're, uh, we're designing it to be able to use right now, but also to make sure that whenever that time comes, um, that whenever we do add apparatus, another fire truck to that or fire engine to that, uh, it's ready to go at that moment. Okay. Well, the the big elephant in the room is um, so you said it's a third. So what what's the cost? An estimated cost? Uh, right um, right now we're estimating uh, the project cost at three point two million. Three point two million. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then if you do it a standalone, if you wait down the road and stand alone with this, what will be the cost? Did we look at it that way, other than more? At one point in time, we were looking at about a 25 to 30% increase in the cost of the building if we did a standalone if it was structure separate. on site. Yeah. On the same site where you don't have to purchase property. 
Yeah. Will this building be LEED certified? We've not discussed that. Okay. Chief, with the PMS moving out here and vacating Station 1, will you have any costs associated with remodeling Station 1 for, for your main offices? I think there will be to some extent, and that will be just for us to be able to utilize um, to try to be able to make sure that it is as functional as possible. I don't, it's not going to be uh, exorbitant. If I can say that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long weekend, sorry. Um, there, there would be some to some extent, but I don't think it would be anything outrageous. Um, what we would, uh, Mr. Runyon and I had spoken about was at that time EMS would take upstairs. Currently, the way it's set up, EMS runs um, a lot of crews out of that building. They have their, their director, their two assistant directors, uh, their EMS supervisor, again, which is like their battalion chief that works that 24-hour shift. He's a 24-hour shift boss. Mm -hmm. um, all those are downstairs, and we have our engine company upstairs. Uh, they have the training room upstairs. So we have a little piece of the pie upstairs. What we would do is we would just split the script. They would take over our upstairs section where we're sleeping. We have a little kitchen area. And then we would use the entirety of the downstairs, still have the training room, which, you know, depending upon how that works, um, you know, it would still go back and forth. If we, we could probably still do a lot of our training at Station 3 in the basement. You all been there, so we have a nice training area there. So that area upstairs may end up being the lounge for the guys. It just depends. But uh, again, we will do it the most cost effective way we can. When you say 3.2 million, is that finished cost? That's all of the all of the inside apparatus that fire stations need, all of the HVAC, all of the It's anything, it, it would not include furniture, okay. but if it's attached to the building, such as kitchen cabinets, um, restroom fixtures, those types of things, that's included. But loose furniture like chairs and beds, no ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Typically, um, you would purchase that um, on your own, probably have some, I don't know, a current vendor or a um, deal with somebody would be better than having the contractor provide that. But just if it's attached to the building and is required for the functioning of the building, that is included in that. Yes. So how far are you as far as the plans go for the uh, the fire station four versus the EMS structure? Uh, EMS is actually um, ready to advertise at the end of this week. For construction? Okay. Yes. And so how far out would the station four be? How, long, how far? Well, I guess what I'm saying, how quick could you catch up if, if it was moved forward? We haven't really talked about that. Well, we estimated it to the committee, I think, the last time at two to three months it yeah. would take to, I would say three to, to months. join the build, the build okay. together. Yeah. And how long would it take to build it all? Oh, probably 16 months. months or so, maybe 18 months. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes. It's a lot to absorb. It <laughs> is. 3.2 million is a lot lower, that's for sure. So what would staffing cost annually, Tim? That, if you'll Chief? give me just a second, I'll Wait. get that next okay. slide. All right, honey. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Yeah. You are. While you're talking about damage, who's working on the cemetery? Did you see all of those trees? Did the, is the city paying for that? I've, I've seen big cranes. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what's okay. going on with that. I spoke with Gene today. Did He's you? got a tree company working on that. Okay. We'll file, file insurance claims for everything. It was huge.
so staffing for station four and uh, this is this is where we've really been trying to work hard to kind of come up with some ideas and, and because I do know that a one time expense is a lot different than reoccurring expenses. Uh, but we want to just kind of lay this out here and kind of show you the different options that we have, uh, different options that uh, are available to us and an option that we had taken once before. So the current staffing for Georgetown Fire Department, we have 51 frontline firefighters. These are, these are the guys that's gonna be coming to your house if it's on fire. So it's 17 people per day. That's if we're fully staffed. That's four on every piece of apparatus. Again, that's three engines, one truck company, and a battalion chief uh, every single day. So the way it breaks down is three battalion chiefs, 12 captains, 36 firefighters. And you have pencil pushers. <laughs> like myself, uh, mm -hmm. I'll speak just for myself, uh, the fire chief. We have two amazing assistant chiefs, um, one of operations, one of prevention. We have our fire marshal, we have our training chief, uh, we have our administrative assistant, uh, Ms. Donna also, and we also have a uh, code enforcement underneath of us as well. So we have two code enforcement officers and a part-time administrative assistant there. Uh, but when it comes to the staffing portion for when it for responses to the fires, the 51 is the number I'd like you to look at. So does that include station four? No, ma'am. Okay, this is just current. Yes. Do you have 51 right now, or where where are you? You said fully staffed. You're not fully staffed, are no, you? No, ma'am. We are. We were five short, uh, and we're short, we're starting a class right now with three. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be two short right now. Uh, they won't go online until about well, about still another three months. They literally just started Monday, last Monday. Okay. So it's 13-week class is what we have right now. All right. Thank you. So, again, we talked about NFPA 1710. This is the standards for the deployment. Uh, we've talked about video. It talks about 15. The number 16 and 17 is <coughs> the aerial devices used. So that's our, our truck company. It's going to respond to every fire. Um, and <coughs> Currently fully staffed, again, this is what I'm trying to really, really want to try to hammer home. Fully staffed, we're at 17, and I got some charts later to show how often that actually happens. The current minimum staffing is 14, and what, about, what I mean by minimum staffing is that is the least that we will ride uh, on our apparatus per day. That ends up being four on our truck company, one battalion chief, and three on each engine. That's the lowest that we will go. Automatic aid does get us three from the county, but as we discussed earlier, depending upon what call volumes they may have or just the, uh, the proximity to the structure fire, you know, it could limit the response time that they are coming. I wanted to show this picture. You know, what's a fire scene look like? I think that when we watch- uh, Chicago. You know, <laughs> I'm there, engine 19. <laughs> One thing, we don't look like that. <laughs> and, number on two, it. and number two, it fire doesn't look like what they presented. Um, you know, I, I, you see Ladder 49 and some of these, when you see them going into a fire and you can see from me to you and a little bit of smoke and a little bit of fire, uh, just close your eyes and that's what it looks like inside a structure fire. Uh, you cannot see, you know, a foot in front of you. It's loud. Um, I'd be lying if I, if I didn't say it wasn't scary. Uh, but so on a structure fire, it's just like when you think about baseball, when you think about football, anything like that, we all have a role to play when it comes to uh, being on scene. The way it would happen initially is that incident commander, which is that coach, right? He's the battalion chief. Uh, and then when one of us arrives on scene, one of the chief officers here, uh, we will take over the command and then he will be operations, right? So he's like the defensive coordinator. He's the one trying to run plays and try to make sure things are working. First thing that we're going to do or he's going to do when he shows up on scene is just walk around the structure. We call it a 360. It allows us to be able to see what we're looking at. It may look, it may look like there's not much fire until you get around the backside and the back, you know, porch is going or vice versa. It's allowing us to see victims. It's allowing us just to kind of see if there's any other hazard or the propane tanks or defensive. What, what do we have what we're looking at? When that first uh, new engine company comes on scene, they're the ones that's gonna be pulling off the pack lines. That's the fire hose. They're gonna be going in, they're gonna be ready. 
uh, meeting at the front door, wherever they end up making entry with their captain. Um, when they do advance in there, a, an important thing to think of is that captain is not uh, the person that's going to be leading that nozzle. That's going to be your new guy, right? Because we want to make or or one of the one of the other firefighters. That captain needs to be, and it's hard for our captains too to kind of stand back, right? When they get onto that, when they get into that role, because they want to do. Uh, but when they get in that role, they have to be watching to make sure their, their folks are safe, looking for the fire, looking for hazards, making sure that they're uh, accountable and our, their folks are there. Then you get to your second due company when they come in, it's going to be your other engine company. Their job is to find that hydrant, right? So they're going to pull the big, the big lines that we have on the truck, the big yellow lines. They're going to hook into the hydrant. We call that providing a water supply. So they're going to be able to bring in because we only have a certain amount of gallons on our on our engines so we can get a start but that's not going to go long so we have to have positive water so that's getting water from the hydrants uh, once we get that water we're good to go to keep on working at that time that another crew that comes in on that same engine is going to be pulling a backup line so they're going to be there in case something happens with that initial attack crew third engine coming in they're going to be, a, we call it a RIP crew, so it's a rapid intervention team. They may be placing ladders, whatever the case may be, but uh, we'll either use that third engine or the county crew coming in. That's for us. That's in case things go sideways and we're able to, uh, you know, once a mayday goes out and, and you know, knock on wood that we don't have that happen here, but that's when our guys are going to be going in to, to save one of our own. The truck company. They come in, their job is to pull up as close to the front as they can so they can ladder it with the aerial on the actual truck or place ladders. We have it now where we change staffing to where we have four on the truck company every day. We're able to utilize that to where we can split that crew in half. We talked about the engineer position at the past couple of council meetings and what that would allow that to do is the captain on that truck can go in, they can search, they can force doors, they can pull sails inside. That engineer on the outside will be that acting officer to where he's going to be able to do stuff outside. You see people cut holes in the roof, that's so that all the heat and the gas can come out of the fire. It increases visibility inside uh, for our firefighters. Everything's coordinated. You know, you can't spray the water inside uh, without making sure that you have the proper ventilation. You're going to steam everybody inside. So it is, it is a team effort. Uh, so you have all these different things going on at one time. Um, and this, this is, again, this is with the number with 17 people. So then you get into the, so they, they classify these, and, and this, the medium and the high hazard on this are going to be showing the same type of numbers, right? But the medium hazard, when you look at it, it's talking about 27 to 28 people. Uh, we'll, we're going to get three people, and these are for initial first alarm assignments, right? The first, second alarm, third alarm, that's basically saying we need more help. These numbers are based on first alarm assignments. So we're going to have, if everybody is at work and we don't have anybody off and there's no vacancies, we're going to have 17 people. If we get three from the county, we're going to have 20 on initial first alarm. That's perfect case scenario. Um, currently, the minimum staffing, again, remember minimum staffing is the lowest that we're going to go. It's set at 14. And I wanted this to kind of go back in and just you know, three's going, we're going to get three from the county, but again, it just depends upon if they're available, uh, if, they're, if that particular close station is going to be not on another call. There's just a lot of factors involved. But if you go around and look, and this, these pictures are actually from our community. I was going to ask you that. Is yeah. this the mill? This is, uh, this is Anderson. Anderson Farms. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the apartments that they build now aren't the apartments that they built uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I think a great example is you look across from Kroger, uh, the new apartments there, garages underneath scares the heck out of me. You know, uh, there's a lot of different factors in the size of them. Uh, they are spaced, but they're spaced the, the minimum that they have to be. Uh, and they're, they're, just, it, they're just massive, massive apartment complexes. They are sprinkled, uh, but again, at the end of the day, uh, they're huge buildings, and it's, they're going to take a lot of people in order to do it. To, to take care of them. This picture is actually Commonwealth Tool and Die. Uh, it's in the business park. It's a 125,000 square foot facility. 
And in that the first uh, presentation, there was a listing of just the different square footages. And the business park has a lot, but even if you look at something like Country Boy, you know, it's nearly 30,000 square feet. Uh, you look at, uh, look at just the hospital, look at the schools, look at all these different facilities that you have, which would be considered high hazard. Uh, when they were talking on that slide, when they're talking about, I forget what the number was, but in the 40s for first response for firefighters, they're talking about high rise buildings. Right, that's why I didn't put that in. Uh, talking about, you know, FDNY, New York, these types of things. But we have plenty of high hazards in our area just with the amount of schools that we have, with the hospitals that we have, with uh, different facilities. And, uh, you know, this they consider this strip malls as well. So if you think of Washington Square, you think of uh, something were to happen out at uh, Tipsy Cow in that particular area. Or Indian Acres. Yeah, so these are, these are what this is set up for. Um, <coughs> So I think these are these are good to share. So this is 2020 staffing, and I wanted to go over three years, um, and uh, I think this is good. And I know 2020 was an odd year just because of COVID, but I wanted to make sure that we threw other years in too. So what this what this is showing you is that um, 167 days out of the year we rode minimum staff. We were only fully staffed, which means we had all, everybody was at work. We had no vacancies, no vacations, no sick, 18 days out of the year. So when we talk about 17 people at a, at a, a structure fire, we had that capability, uh, you know, 18 times in 2020. 2021, it was nine times. Um, we, we went minimum staffing uh, almost 150 days. And then 2022, it was seven days. Uh, and, and then some of this comes into play, uh, we talk about, and I know that, first off, I want to apologize for the new council members <laughs> and for the existing council members. I do know this is a lot. It is, it is a lot uh, to go through and to talk about and to have to digest and, and the window of opportunity that we have, I know is small. Uh, but I just wanted to share this with you that, you know, just like Chief Allgood mentioned last week, I mean, this, this is because it's paid, because of other factors that we have, uh, we have had people leave to go to different departments. And I'll, and I'll discuss some of that later, but uh, you, just, you see that what we deal with when it comes to just staffing in general. So if you were, if you had the 51, if you had the full complement of 51 firefighters and everybody was at work every single day, would the fully staffed number then go up or would you still be short on personnel? If you were fully staffed at the present time, because even when Mark is talking about being fully staffed and everybody's at work, that's not taking in sick or vacation, right? That's just everybody working every day. That, that's what this fully staffed is. It's that out of that out of that year in 2020, we had seven times that that happened. There's no no extra bodies that you have that you can shuffle. But but even if you. Right, right now at the present time, you're, you're, five, off of, you're five, five firefighters short. Yes, sir. You've got three that just started. Yes, sir. Three new recruits that just started. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. If you had those five firefighters right now with no openings, would the fully staffed number go up or are you still short on personnel? If we were, okay, I, I think I know what you're saying now, and if I don't, then just let me know. If we had... 51 firefighters right now, fully staffed fire department. We're gonna to have to where we have, um, we're still gonna have our sick, right? We're still gonna have our vacation. The, the, the thing that hasn't changed over the last several years is uh, either retirements, people leaving, uh, people going for either private sector or just going to other departments. We haven't had a year since, I would say probably 2016 or 17 to where we've even been able to be fully staffed just for the fact of uh, people going to other departments or retirees. Even next year, 2025 is a great example, right? 
Um, I'm eligible to retire. Uh, Chief Gifford's eligible to retire. We have two battalion chiefs eligible to retire, and uh, our fire marshal can leave. Uh, we have a couple captains that can leave as well. It's just a never ending cycle. But that fully staff number is based on your engines and the number of people you have to put on the engine on any given shift. So the, the <coughs> 17 number is based on the number of stations and the number of engines and the personnel required to yes. man, woman, those engines for one shift, for one shift under NFCA standards. <laughs> so the, the number is the number at 51 based on the number of stations and number of engines, yes. right? I think my question is, so if you were fully staffed with 51, your seven day and your 17 day would increase to maybe 50 days of being fully staffed or out of that 160. If we were, if we were able to, yes, if we had, if we, if we had 51 people, total people that were on the line firefighters, we were fully staffed, uh, say this class we had coming through, that was five people. Yeah. Say that was the case. It's okay. three people right now. But say we had five people going through this class, we would be fully staffed uh, for you know a fair amount of time. But you still got to think about people taking vacations, still people being sick. <coughs> but then you go again through that next cycle next year to where we do the same thing, and we're down another five or six people. Uh, I guess my question is, when you when you're bringing up that you have fully staffed, you had seven days. You're fully staffed one truck. You had 14 days. So if if you were fully staffed, you would have more days of being fully staffed versus not. Even though with vacation and uh, sick or any of that stuff, you're still going to have that, but that's going to increase. It would increase. Okay. It would increase. Yeah. All right. Chief, let me ask you a question. FBI dictates that number of police officers is based on population. Based on population, two and a half police officers for every thousand. So technically, we should be somewhere in the 70 to 85 police officers. What's the NFPA standard? We're right. I'll, I'll get to that too, sir. But we're 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 close to that. Okay. And it, and I think that would I think that's going to help explain I think some of this further. One more question. Yes, sir. The three recruits that just started. How many applicants did you have total? That that were in that pool of candidates. Uh. When we, what was it last time? We had 90, let me, we had 93 people apply. Whoa. Is this correct? Help me out here. 92 people applied. We had less than half show up to take the written test. 40 took the written test, and we had 20 that passed the test. We interviewed, that's approximate passed the test, but it's right around the 20. And then when we interviewed, um, we were able to get five out of the list that we felt and it's you know very similar to what chief all good and, and honestly we we just went to the fire commission meeting the other day and it's something that we're dealing with all across the state so this particular uh right here i think that the staffing when it comes to the 17 i think what's important to talk about too is just that response time um and I wanted to give a case study. This was a, a fire that we actually had this year. This was in Pleasant Valley. And the way NFPA 1710, it goes anything from the, the, how quick the call has to go through, dispatch, how quick they turn it around, how quick the turnout time is, which is basically how quick after our guys at the station get the tone to when they're dressed and they're out the door. Uh, that turnout time is 80 seconds. We have uh, four personnel on scene of a structure fire within four minutes from leaving the station. It's also that criteria. Uh, we had a fire in Pleasant Valley. This was at 523 in the morning. And if you were like me at 523 in the morning on this day, you were asleep. Uh, these guys were as well. And they were out the door at our firehouse going to the station, going to the structure fire in 68 seconds. I can assure you that we are not going to be the reason we're delayed on responses. Uh, we train very hardly to make, very hard to make sure that we, uh, that we don't have to make up time on the road is what we say. Um, we, we, so we were, we were uh, in a net there. It took us five minutes and 39 seconds to get to this fire. Now, in this next video, I think we'll maybe explain a little bit better. It, that makes it not <coughs> a very big deal. A minute 40 seconds, minute 39 seconds outside of that window. 
Uh, but this was also, this was raining that day, but it was also at 5.30 in the morning. You didn't have Toyota traffic. Uh, you didn't have a lot of the same issues that you would deal with in the afternoon when people are getting off work, going to Walmart, those types of things, because that engine that is, that is going to this structure fire in Pleasant Valley is coming from Station 2, which is across from Van Cummins, and having to go through all that. Uh, this next video is going to show you the importance of a four minute time period. Uh, so I'll talk through some of this. Uh, it is, I mean, it's, there's no audio to it. I'll have to be the audio. <laughs> Hopefully I can be the video too. All right, so we talked earlier about Chicago Fire, we talked about Ladder 49, we talked about all these types of things. Sign, fire is a very uh, dynamic field and um, there's, there's a lot of studies on it. We're always trying to figure out ways to make it safer. EKU is one of the standard bearers in the country for fire signs. Uh, we have people that are, uh, Chief Gifford uh, is, you know, has degrees in this type of stuff. And we have our fire inspector he has a, a master's degree you know, in fire science. So it's a very, very uh, important field of study. And what a lot of these places do is just try to figure out what is most important and how do things burn now compared to what they did. So if you look at that legacy room, this I would, I would call this my granny's house. Uh, you go to your granny's house and the furniture was solid, the furniture was made differently. Uh, it's even look in this room and you look at the chairs you're sitting in. You know, it's not the, the hard wooden chairs like you said at Granny's house. It's got foam inside of it, the carpet that's in here. You know, the older, a lot of the older homes had hardwood flooring. To be quite honest, they were built a heck of a lot better than they are now. Uh, they're a lot more, um, you can work in them longer than you can new construction just because of the truss system. So what this is, this shows what a modern fire looks like. And your smoke detector's going off right about now. Maybe you've already called 911, maybe you haven't. Uh, but then we're about a minute and 30 seconds in the modern room compared to what the legacy room would look like. You can see it's already starting to bank down and what we call that is when the room fills with smoke and then it starts, it hits the top and it's gotta go somewhere. So it starts coming back down. And this is what you see when you start going into a fire. If we see this when we go in, we're lucky. Uh, what ends up happening is it ends up banking all the way down through the floor and that's where you have zero visibility. High heat, zero visibility. Ultimately what's going to happen is we call it flashover and that's when a room reaches a certain, everything in the room reaches an ignition temperature. Everything's going to go. Again, the legacy room is still going, still trucking along, it's working its way, but you can see the modern room is starting to really pick up. And again, that's because of the furnishings that you're dealing with primarily. Uh, but then once it gets into that, and if you're, you know, we go into a lot of houses and not only is it a matter of furnishings, it's just the amount of stuff that is in these homes now. Uh, we're going into these houses without any visibility, without ever being in those houses uh, and having to utilize our training with search techniques, left-hand search, right-hand search, or using the wall. Uh, to go in, make sure we don't lose contact with the wall because we can't see when we go in these places. So a big thing when it comes to staffing and when it comes to response isn't, it is, and, and everybody that ever signed up to be a firefighter, and I can speak for them, uh, we will lay down our life for somebody else. We will do it. But my job as chief is to make sure my guys don't have to lay down their life because of the lack of time it takes for us to get out there and what we're facing when we get there. And the construction that we currently have, when we talk about Pleasant Valley, we talk about uh, some of these newer neighborhoods, they're not built like Granny's house. So this is what we're facing when we show up. And this is one room, we call it, this would be a room and content fire because it's one room. It's not gonna stay in that room because it's gonna burn through that hollow core door if the door's closed. If the door's open, it's gonna spread throughout the entirety of the home. So minutes matter. And we're not even at the four minute mark yet. And again, this would be if somebody had called 
the second they dropped the cigarette or whatever it was that caused the fire. Not even when they started noticing it was burning. Uh, if this was again the five o'clock in the morning that we're talking about, you know, they may be upstairs, they may still be here at their smoke detectors. Uh, but this is why time is so crucial for us to be able to do that. This video, the, the concept of this video was to just to talk about modern rooms compared to legacy rooms and what takes now less than four minutes for a, a room to go completely into flashover stage, which again is when everything in the room reaches ignition temperature. Uh, it's three minutes and 40 seconds compared to Granny's house, which is almost 30 minutes. And it may be past that. This, this gets into uh, what Mr. Stone was talking about to some extent, the, the number of firefighters per 1,000 residents. Um, 2018, some of y'all were on council, some of you were not. Maybe y'all were watching council meetings, but the city did a thorough study uh, within the fire department, within the police department, public works, our finances, our revenues. Um, and in 2018, uh, the number of firefighters per 1,000 residents, uh, was it, uh, sorry, 1.63. At that time, uh, we were at a 20 firefighter gap. This is in 2018, our peer averages were 2.22, uh, we're at 1.63 at the time. Um, a lot of our peer cities, uh, they're not growing as we are. Honestly, some of our peer cities have lost population as we gain population. Covington has lost people. Uh, we have, there's certain areas that, you know, we're continuing to increase in population. They're staying stable. But at 2018, this is what we were. Today, and I broke this down into two different ways, and I, I, th I felt it was important for us to do that. I did 38,000 population. Census has us at 37.7. Again, that's 2020 census. Um, you know, I would put us closer probably to 40,000, but we'll go with 38. The 51 firefighters that we have, I put those are the line guys, those are the guys, those are the heroes that are going to be out there coming to your house if something happens. Uh, we have uh, 1.34 is what our per 1,000 is. If you add in myself, uh, Chief Gifford, Chief Johnson, our fire marshal, our training chief, um, that gets us to 56 firefighters. Uh, we're at 1.47 per 1,000. Uh, the thing is, we are going to come back in on a structure fire. We actually will talk about that too and what we've done to try to improve things. Um, this was actually Chief Colson that did this. He, he, he added it to where we would come back in. So every fire, we're going to bring back in a safety officer and we're going to bring back in uh, an incident commander to help out with the call. It's going to be delayed coming back in, but we're going to try to get there as quick as we can. But I, w I felt it was important to share both of those numbers. Chief, but what is the NFPA standard per 1,000? Did I miss that? Uh, the NFPA standard, I would have to get exactly back with you on what that is, but it's right around what the same as FBI. I don't want to give you an exact number, but it's right about what Todd, Mr. Stone was talking about for the FBI Academy. Yeah, but for clarification purposes, though, when you've got an automatic aid agreement with the county, and if we're at full complement of 56, aren't they also over 50? Is, is, isn't the county over 50 firefighters right now? They have they have 48 firefighters and three administrative, I believe, so 51. <coughs> but if you if you took those numbers combined, granted you're covering the entire county. But wouldn't those numbers go up per 1,000 residents? Mm -hmm. No, it would just be strictly for the city. Strictly for the city, because even though the, it's like the sheriff's office, the sheriff's office does cover calls in the city, but they're strictly, the city of Georgetown strictly bases the numbers of officers based upon the residents. Yeah, but when you've got an automatic aid agreement and the county's coming into the city, 
I, I'd like to know that if we can think, try to get some answers. On I think the I think to answer the question is your automatic agreement is going to help with your initial response. I think it's a challenge to, to count them in for your total per. I'll get you I'll get you that number on what it would be per uh, if you added the county in the mix too. I think the biggest thing that that I just want to make sure the point is is that we are two separate departments. You know, the county has a responsibility to take care of the people that they deal with in the county. We have a responsibility to deal with people we do in the city. I think we work very well together. And when things go really, really bad, we're there, you know, blood, sweat, and tears fighting through it all. But we have a responsibility with what we have to deal with what we have within the city. And Tim, one, one more question. I'm sorry, Chief, I shouldn't have called you by your Tell first me, name. Tim. <laughs> Chief, I'm... Tim's fine, I'd rather. <laughs> I'm just the graph that you have here. When was the? Pardon me for not knowing this right offhand. When was the safer grant? 2007. Seven. And it was for five years, right? Uh, the safer grant, the way that it ran last time, uh, that was Chief Bruin at the time, and it went over. I'm thinking it was. A, I thought it was a three-year deal as well, but it was graduated. It, it may have been five. It years, was five. But years. it was graduated I the think way it did. they're shorter now. Yeah. Uh, but it was a graduating scale as opposed to the coverage it is now. It was more of a 80, 60, 40, 20, something like that. Mm -hmm. So prior to 2004, um, and this, you know, the long history of the Georgetown Fire Department, you know, back in the day it was part-timers, there was all that. When we went to a fully uh, paid fire department, in 2004, prior to that, we were three people per apparatus. So that's what we ran. In July of 2004, uh, there was three firefighters that were hired. Uh, the intent of that was to make sure that we had four people on our truck company, the ladder truck, every single day. The population then was 19,638. Uh, 2007 is when the SAFER grant came into play. We hired nine people, so you added nine to those three that were hired in 2004. That gave us 12, so that put us at four per apparatus. Population then was just under 21,000, and we made 1,717 runs. 2023, staffing is still 51 firefighters. Uh, population, again, this is the census data, uh, it's 37,730. Last year, we made 3,269 runs. Uh, so I think it's important, too, to talk about, you know, when we, when we talk about response to structure fires, when we talk about staffing and station placements, you know, very rarely, you know, or it, it's it's not uncommon for there to be a structure fire that's toned out and we're already got somebody maybe at another call, right? So you're already behind the eight ball starting from there. Just based on the runs that we have, you have opportunities available to where you're going to be called out for a fire, but you still got other crews tied up just with other runs. Chief, when you say there's this number of runs, does that include false alarm runs? It does. So what percentage of these runs would you say end up being false alarms? Um, Johnson, you got a good I idea. I don't have that right now, but I can easily get that to you. We can break it down into five or seven. Yeah. And the thing about false alarms is, when we get there, we know they're false alarms. Yeah. When they're, <clears throat> but when we're toned out, we don't, you know. Uh, so we respond to them just as if just as if they were the real deal. We talked about ISO earlier, uh, insurance service organization. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to be in this photo with Mr. Prather, <coughs> Mayor Prather, and uh, this was Chief Ford at the time. This was uh, when we went from a class three to a class two in our ISO ranking. Uh, proud to be class two in the city. And what it is is that there's less than 2% of fire departments across the country that are class two. Um, so what exactly is that and how is the ISO rating scored? Um, they, they, what they do is it's called a fire, fire suppression rating schedule. So we'll meet with them and they're actually due to come in at any time. Uh, they were supposed to come in this last fall. And, uh, they haven't been in yet. But when you do, you pull all your run data, you pull information from the water company, you pull information from dispatch. You, it's a collectively of how is your city, not only your fire department, but how is your city able to handle emergency responses. 
Uh, so the emergency communication system is 10 points. Fire department is 50 points. So that goes into covering personnel, capabilities, training, equipment. Uh, water, water supply is 40 points. And community risk reduction is 5.5 points. Uh, it's 100 point scale and you get bonus points uh, for actually getting into um, the, the extra points that you're able to get from community risk reduction. Yeah. So uh, the, what have we done to improve the score? We've added communications. The city and the county went in on a radio system to be able to join that. Uh, so that, that is going to be a big help. Uh, water supply, I know we've had issues just with the water company in general as far as, uh, not with the water company, but just with rate increase, just to be able to make sure that things are being able to get done. But we've worked well with GMWSS for mapping, data collection. So I feel confident when uh, ISO comes in, we're going to be able to give them the information they need on that end. Training, uh, we do a lot of training, so that's not going to be an issue whatsoever. Our equipment that we have, uh, minimum staffing increase, I think it's going to help us. The SOPs, bringing in an incident commander and safety officer to structure fires, I think that'll help us as well. Uh, the efforts of fire prevention and code enforcement, I think, are going to help us out with the bonus points when we do end up coming back in. Uh, ISO uses very similar parameters in FPA when it talks about effectiveness of the fire department. So they talk about staffing. They mentioned four per apparatus. Uh, and then they also talk about the uh, four minute responses. So ISO, what does it do for Georgetown? Uh, when we went from a class three to a two, uh, we spoke with the insurance broker here in town. He says that it would, uh, it saved the average homeowner between 50 to $200 annually. Uh, what this does for insurance companies is it shows it's the we're less so they're they're uh, at less of a risk as far as making sure things are uh, not going to burn. Uh, obviously, this is beneficial for the industry side. It shows investors the community is safe and their investments are uh, in good hands. The goal for any fire department is to be a class one. That's ours as well. Um, and by adding station to men and women, I think that we can get closer to that goal. If we don't keep up with our response times, it's not impossible to go backwards. So this, we'll go through the safer grant opportunity, and this is just a few slides, and then I'll be able to answer some questions. So the way that the safer grant would work now, uh, Ms. Tackett talked about the five year when it, when it was back in 2007. The way the safer grant is now, it's three years, 100% coverage. That includes. Uh, pay and benefits. Uh, so grant follows NFPA 1710 staffing standards. So what I mean by that is we can't ask, we can't put in a grant for six people or nine people. Uh, NFPA, I'm sorry, the SAFER and the federal government believes in NFPA 1710 so much that they're willing to give money to departments that are following the standards. So the only way we could get a SAFER grant would be to get 12 people. Uh, it's not new to the city of Georgetown. We did this in 2007. Um, that's what got us into four firefighters per apparatus. Um, and then, you know, just talking about w what this would do is this allows us to every single day, our minimum staffing at that point, if we had four additional personnel, um, that would get us at the minimum staffing every single day would put us at 17 people which would be at that, that threshold that we're talking about. We will not shut down a station. We do have <coughs> things in play that we're going to do. We, we have mandatory overtime. Uh, if people call in sick and, and it's not covered, people are on a list that they're going to have to work. Uh, and then we even have emergency overtime. And that's where you're voluntold you're going to work that day. Um, Safer grant funding and Stacy may be able to help me out with this. I took the numbers that she had. Uh, 12 firefighters for the SAFER grant, year one, two, and three, there would be no expense. Uh, year four, uh, I took what it would be now, which is right about 102000 for a firefighter, and I put uh, 12 to 20 percent on top of that, which would allow for a three to five percent cost of living raise. So that at the bottom number would be what would be uh, after year four. That would have to be recurring revenue to, to take that. 
so the benefits of NFPA 1710 uh, keep us in compliance with our with staffing standards uh, for per apparatus. Again, it puts us at minimum staffing 217, which is what is needed for that 2,000 square foot single family dwelling, uh, and gets us closer to our numbers for our medium and high hazards. When you talk about having 17 on shift, or if you have everybody at work that day, when you have <coughs> people, when you have the county. Uh, you know, it's going to get us closer where we need to be for those medium and high hazard events. So the way that this would work is uh, the, the application is actually due March 17th. Seriously? <laughs> I, I have you already say. been working on that, Tim? Yes, ma'am. All right, then. I haven't, but <laughs> Chief Johnson has. Okay. Um, so the application is due March 17th. The grant would be awarded the summer or fall of this year. Uh, you have six months after you get the grant awarded to actually act, have to spend the money. So I think that this would be, I, I put out potential start date February 24, right? If you end up getting it this fall, you have six months to make sure that we do have a good uh, group of folks and we can use PR firm or whatever we have to do to make sure that we can get folks in there to interview. Uh, you talked about starting February, January, February, March of 24. I'm sorry. Yeah, 24. Mm -hmm. Um, the city wouldn't be responsible to cover any costs until February, March 27. Um, Georgetown Fire Department is committed to helping with revenue, and I know that there's there's things that other departments and other cities are doing, and I can just tell you we're committed to being able to do whatever we can to make sure that you guys have all the information you can to be able to help out with that <coughs> end of it. Um, this is the last slide I have. So the majority of the time, uh, we're at a minimum staffing, which is 14. Uh, this, again, vacant, vacations, sick, injuries, vacancies. Uh, retirement people leaving for other departments uh, are causing vacancies. So the staffing for the new station would put us at 17. Uh, we have increased staffing since 07, and that was from a safer grant. A uh, safer grant would be uh, covered for three years uh, on a fully functioning day you know we would have 21 people on shift uh, the response times that's it works in with it ISO as well when you talk about that they're using the same parameters um, and staffing appropriately eliminates the need for uh, overtime as much overtime uh, overtime is a great thing I know I enjoyed it when I was a young firefighter but um, and I put this in here at the end and this I'm not being uh, dramatic and I'm not trying to be facetious but uh, suicide is the leading cause of death for first responders. And our guys that we have now, our young guys, are seeing a lot more stuff than I did even when I was a new guy. Uh, between the deaths from overdoses, uh, suicides, um, they're seeing a lot of bad stuff now, and they need their time off. <coughs> just in closing, real quick, uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, I want to thank my staff for helping out with this presentation. I want to thank our firefighters just for what they do every single day. And I want to ensure that the citizens of Georgetown know that they have a world-class fire department. Um, I'd put our guys up against anybody in the country. I know you guys have a tough job. I know you do. You get, you're getting a lot of stuff thrown at you. And before I was chief, I had the honor to be able to be on fiscal court for six months. I got just a little taste of it. <laughs> But that was also during the budget prep time, and I know that you have people calling about ball fields, and you got people calling about parks, you got people calling about police, and there's everything, and I, I wish we could just win the lottery. <coughs> but, um, you know, between that, and I witnessed my dad on council for nearly two decades, so I know that you, you have to, you only have the money that you have, right? <coughs> but I don't think I would be doing my, my job if I didn't present the case for this project. And as a chief of eight months on the job, I would rather not honestly have to do this, but uh, I, I just feel like it is my responsibility uh, to do that. Um, in the last council meeting, Chief Allgood came before this body and he talked about vacancies uh, where people have left for other agencies, uh, you know, to go to the private sector or to other departments. He told you there were 17 police officers that have left uh, where we're lockstep in line with him. Um, Exa almost exact number of people since 17 and almost the same amount of pay differential between uh, other departments. We're losing people to other cities that are smaller than us because of pay. We've lost people to Covington. We're getting ready to pass them uh, in population. Uh, we've also lost the departments that are smaller than us 
<coughs> Frankfurt, Burlington, Ellesmere, Hebron, Florence, just to name a few. And these departments are doing, you know, some of these cities are doing some things that I think would bring in some revenue streams that could help us out. Um, also, I think it's important too just to discuss merger. Uh, whenever we talk about hiring people or building stations or, or getting apparatus, the conversations of merging does happen. Uh, Chief Ward and I have had a lot of conversations, and, and trust me, we're both committed to doing whatever it is it takes to ensure that the citizens of Georgetown and Scott County are safe. Uh, we're fine with the conversations, and if that's the route that we go eventually, uh, we'll do all that we can to make sure uh, neither one of us are power hungry enough to fight over who's at the top. Uh, <coughs> the only reason I mentioned merging is that merging doesn't close the gap in the response times in this area. Um, Merging doesn't stop the need for a station on the western part of the city, where we're going to have to look at eventually uh, where the growth of the new bypass and existing homes are. I just feel it's necessary to say that. Mayor, uh, Devin, and those that have been on our fire committee, uh, Ms. Hambrick, Ms. Showal Sister Showalter, uh, Ms. Wilkins Bryant, uh, have heard me say that I will ask for our needs and nothing more, nothing less. We all have wants. But I'm hopeful that I was convey the need today for the additional station and 12 personnel to take the staff. I tell our firefighters that they're going to bring me problems, bring solutions, and I hope that not just brought problems but solutions uh, as we discuss the reduction of costs in the new station and the safer grant opportunity. And we're committed to uh, to bringing solutions to the table, and not just problems. Uh, we'll bring ideas as we move forward. Again, thank you for your time. I do have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I do appreciate all the information. Yeah, thank you. But <clears throat> and just in our conversations, um, the one thing that we have talked about has been ta tax districting. Um, can you educate, not tonight, but at some point, can you educate us on that and how, how does that work and how long does it take it to get it into effect and what the process would be to do that? I know you said that there are other cities that do do ta tax districting. Yeah. I would like to have more information on that, please. And I would love to provide that with you. And that's what a lot of these other departments and cities are doing. Uh, it's set up similar to a water company. I don't want to elaborate too much on it because I want to educate myself even more on it. And I plan on taking some field trips here in the next couple of weeks to do that. Um, you know, just to talk, but I've looked at the KRS and I've looked at different options and it's very similar to what a property tax would be. And I know that we've, you know, within the city, just the way things have been set up in the past, we're limited on how we can increase uh, property tax. This is a way that we could do that. And as a taxpayer myself, I'm not, you know, I don't want to speak for 38,000 people. <laughs> I'm pretty sure right. That. But I think if people know what they're getting, they're maybe not as apt to worry about, you know, having to pay for something. So there are different revenue streams in that, and I will be glad to present information to you all on that. That would be wonderful. And the beauty of something as, as that, uh, what that does, it frees up money in the general fund. Uh, I'm a firefighter, but I want more police as well. So if we're able to free up money in that regard, it allows us to be able to get more police, public works employees, um, other stuff. Mm -hmm. Chief, can I can I ask you? Yes, sir. Sorry. If you don't have the information, maybe Stacy does. Uh, pardon me for not having it because I, I wasn't prepared for this one. But looking at the. Georgetown Fire Department Station 4 proposal when you when you flip over to the 2006 comprehensive plan yes uh, the plan or this st um, it's stated that the current budget which I'm assuming that's where the Georgetown Fire Department is slightly over four million dollars now granted that was 17 years ago but it was before you added the safer grant and the additional three i guess 12 office 12 firefighters have been added since then yes sir do you have the number what the what your overall current budget is right now as of today it's right it's right around seven million just a little bit over yeah. like 7.2 operating is around a million most other capacity. So that that would be <coughs> since we haven't built a new fire station, that would be strictly salary and benefits. Yeah. So it's gone up 
it's gone up a little over three million dollars. Now, granted, that's over a seventeen million. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, a seventeen year period. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Chief, do you mind if I make a comment about the timeline? I know um, we talked about the deadline for the safer grant, and I think probably a question that some people in the public might have is why is this presentation coming Seven. here, and why is this grant application due in uh, less than two weeks? So the notice of funding opportunity for this in they announced the funding and the cycle closes 30 days later. So the funding was announced two weeks ago. Um, actually, the day after we were sitting in fire committee talking about the project. So the other reason for the timeline here is obviously that the county has, the county's committed to building the EMS station. They've been committed, the council's committed its 50% of that project um, actually in the last budget cycle. So that project we've always known is moving forward. The question is whether whether the fire station is, is moving with it. So the reason we're at the table today is because the county is prepared to advertise this for bid, but also the timeline for, for the safer grant is kind of upon us. So um, I, won't, I won't speak for mayor on next steps, but um, knowing that we have to submit that application and knowing that our application will be much stronger if we have the council supporting the project or not. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things that at the next, next council meeting, I think I think Mayor and uh, Chief Thompson will will be asking for some direction um, because if we're if we're going to move forward with the construction documents and put it out to bid, our safer grant application looks a lot better um, and it's a lot more uh, reasonable as opposed to saying, hey, we think our council might might approve us moving forward with this in the future. So that's just something for everybody to marinate in. I'm sure people have questions following this meeting, but I did want to get context on the time. <coughs> um, and I know that Assistant Chief Johnson actually is a, is a great asset to the department because he does some consulting and grant writing um, as well as well as his role in the department. So he's he's been working on that application already and um, it'll be ready if, if the council has the appetite for the project. Is it electronically done or is it mailed? Electronically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot to marinate. Don't let the chief send it in. Kind of yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Um, since we've been a while, uh, let's take about a 10 minute recess and, and you kids go outside and make sure you come back, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you have food or water? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the teacher oh, coming out of here. Is there anything in the machine out there? <laughs> Devin. <laughs> Devin. <laughs> Yes, yeah, 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 some kids will come back. Been, been a while since I've been called a kid. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's what we need. Thank you, Chief. Oh, it's interesting. Risk room if I get out. I'm going to wait until you go. Thank you so much. You know, if you you know you architects, you're all you're all saying if you want to watch some more architects talk, stick around. When you sit for a minute, you get stiff. Thanks. Sarah to the rescue. Oh, I could hear you fine. The only time, it, the only reason I came in.
Hall. Introduce yourself and tell us what you, what you got. Mechanical, plumbing, electrical. So they are here to help back us up if we have questions. Um, I think the point of this presentation, is we're not going to go as long as the previous presentation. I'll just say that right now. Um, I can I, talk fast. <laughs> well, is to give you an overview of where we are in the project. We spent the um, entire 2022 developing drawings for this project, and then um, Cadell came on about mid-year uh, when we were in the middle of design development or actually schematic design, and then they help price um, different phases along the way. Um, as with everything, <coughs> we've come in a little over budget, and we have developed some packages or ways to think about the project and are going to look to you for some guidance. Not today. We're not making any decisions today, but just to give you the information so that you have that um, as you think about it. It's an important building. I want to reiterate that. and. Um, Based on the previous presentation, it's also not going to catch fire so fast. So, <laughs> so uh, we hope that you keep it and um, and do what you can um, with what we've presented. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. She's going to walk through uh, where we are and um, what we have in the design documents now, and how we have sliced and diced it to figure out ways to make logical projects move forward. Um, so again, we'll skip the agenda. We're just going to go through it. You guys will see what we've got. Um, <clears throat> so why are we here? Like Karen said, we have um, three options as we've looked at um, how to piece this together and see what makes sense going forward. Um, so what we're hoping to do is determine, not tonight, but um, give you guys what you need so that we can determine how to proceed with the project. Just a quick look back at um, the project budget. That green is really different on the screen, so it's very bright. Um, uh, project budget based on the contract amount. So we were um, coming in just under nine million um, all in for the project. Uh, when we did our cost check at 75% CDs, uh, we were coming in at just over nine million. This was um, with feedback from subcontractors uh, and getting some real-time numbers applied to the project. So we were still within um, shooting range of where the original budget was at 9.1 million. We knew we had um, some work to do. We also had 15% contingency built into this cost. Um, so 15% of that that cost was set aside for um, budget over or uh, bid overage or um, change orders or anything like that. Um, on the uh, quickly historic tax credits, because that does factor into this project, um, what we're trying to do is pursue those uh, state tax credits, um, which could be up to 20% of the project costs. Um, right now, the state has allocated $100 million worth of, of funding available for tax credits. So um, that would be key for this project to be able to take advantage of uh, as much of that as we could. We submitted part one and part two of that in November of last year. Um, we got a quick update today. Unfortunately, we are not quite where we were hoping to be. It is currently under review. It has been sent to a couple of different reviewers as they are trying to deal with their staffing issues. Um, so we have requested feedback for prelim preliminary comments. Everything is due by April 30th. Um, so we've already sent our stuff in. There's nothing else that we have to give them. Um, they, they, they require, they're required to respond to us by April 29th. Correct. And then we have 30 days to give anything back to them um, that is needed. And I think June 29th is the date when the decisions go out. 
what we want to do though is get preliminary feedback from them so that we know you know these are our um, targets we're talking about you know slate roof and masonry restoration and all these things that could help factor into that and um, getting that feedback from them lets us know what our chances are of getting that funding and what we need to concentrate on what we need to make sure we include in the project to maximize that funding um, next steps obviously once we figure out what we can take advantage of um, for the city to partner with a bank familiar with tax credit process they're the ones that are actually the broker of the credits I think you guys have maybe started that process but we're just putting this in as a holistic look at where we are um, so what we're gonna do is take a quick look at the project there are a lot of you who have seen a lot of this before there are some of you who have not seen it at all so um, I'm going to try to balance this by not going long but also giving you all the information that you need we have developed three options um, since when the bids came in and as Karen mentioned we were over budget we kind of pulled back a little bit we looked at three different options for how to continue with this project the first is the total project all in kind of what we originally designed um, which includes some site improvements on the front and alternate to also redo the back patio um, all the exterior improvements so repairing the stone and masonry replacing the windows replacing the roof the cornice all the metal accents um, restoring some of the original window openings uh, from uh, like when it was a fire station had the big domed window over the front um, and then we had two alternates with that one with the rear stair tower uh, and one with the slate roof um, also looking at modernizing the interior so that includes complete building systems upgrades um, a complete interior reconfiguration to allow for expansion of offices um, update council chambers update restrooms restrooms for ADA compliance um, and then upgrade all the interior finishes and then finally the renovation of the third floor trying to take advantage of that attic space up there for additional office space which allows for further um, expansion and growth of the the different departments um, that would include renovating the historic tower for the mayor's office um, and extending the elevator and stairs up to that level and then there was also an alternate for um, the mezzanine restoration real quick what we did is we kind of went in with a base bid this is what we think you should do we included these alternates um, to take advantage of some pricing if if things came in under budget and we had extra money we could do these extra things um, add alternates you generally get better pricing on than deductive alternates so you, you know you could go for all-in big dream but then have to take pieces out of that and um, you typically don't get as good of pricing on the back end as you do when you're adding it in so that's why we went that way with those alternates so just a quick look back the site improvements um, on the front which is a part of the base bid we are redoing the stair at the main entry and putting um, a ramp in uh, that works a little bit better with the current configuration um, it also allowed us to put a planner box in I have the laser here but I've been dangerous with it before and I don't want to <laughs> blind anybody right see they know they've been here with me before yes. um, so I maybe am not going to use the pointer but <laughs> we could put a planner <coughs> to the left of the entry um, we put a planner around the uh, ramp there at the right of the entry and then we were also able to put a flagpole there sort of centrally located um, redo the the paving out there with some brick pavers that kind of turned the corner and then stopped at the same place where the stone stops um, there at the tower and that uh, is sort of dressing up the front entry and really signifying that is where our monumental entrance is the rear patio on the back was what our at alternate was so if we were lucky enough to have some money left over we wanted to improve the the patio right out back here reconfigure the parking out there a little bit to give um, a better more permanent space for the dumpsters um, and then just try to take advantage of that exterior <coughs> space that was out there um, so image on the my left fill your eyes left all right um, 
would be with the completely renovated facade on the front, um, restoring the elements to, um, you can see the kind of curved window there over um, the main window uh, and restoring the metal work to what it would have been originally. On the back side, we proposed the enclosure on the stair tower to be different and more of its time so that you can tell um, that it is, we're not trying to be like the existing building, um, it is separate from that and that's a, a metal panel system for the stair tower. On the floor plans, um, and I may not go through this in, in big detail unless anybody has specific questions. And I'll send this out to council mm -hmm. as well so you'll have it electronically. Yes. There's a lot of information in here and there are a lot of numbers in here so we didn't necessarily want to put everything in front of you and have anybody um, be intimidated by all of the information. So we're going to go through it up here and then you can get it afterwards to digest it a little bit further. Um, on the lower level, we have uh, mainly storage and back of house space, mechanical electrical rooms. Um, we do have the break room down there and then a training room, trying to take advantage of some of those bigger spaces for um, some of those more gathering type functions. On the first floor, keeping that really the public floor, um, making a little bit bigger vestibule as you come in the building. Um, to your right, you would have the city clerk's office, which has a um, uh, secure vestibule for that and then to the left right now it's a multi-purpose space but I'm sure there are lots of lots of things that you guys can can think to do with that space um, and then the the main goal was to try to increase the size of council chambers um, we obviously have the vault that is right behind that area so um, our structural engineers did some fancy work to figure out how to take that out and um, be able to make this space bigger and accommodate, um, I think we were at 96 seats um, total. Um, we also created a council lounge um, off to the right and then on all floors revamping the restrooms to comply with current ADA um, guidelines. Moving up to the second floor on your left, Basically creating um, sort of a around the perimeter, um, the office space, and then having some open office there in the middle, um, utilizing glass walls there so that light can still come into that workspace on the interior. Um, in what is currently the mayor's office, that would become a big meeting room. Um, and then again with the um, renovated restrooms on that level as well. Moving up to the third floor, additional office space. Um, the tower, which right now is the only space left in the building with the most historic fabric left. Um, it has the wood floors up there, the original wood base, an original door. It's really cool. It's a tad scary to get up the um, ladder at the moment, but um, the thought is that we could utilize that that space up there, um, it's wide open, it's tall, uh, and try to really take advantage of that for this increased office space and also allow for future growth um, for any of these offices. That's a very quick floor plan uh, review. Um, just to give a quick look of the sort of design intent behind some of these spaces in the main public areas, mainly on the first floor, trying to keep with the sort of traditional historic look of what you know would have been here when the building was built. Um, when we look at the office and support areas, it's a little bit more modern, sort of a mix of two. We don't want to um, have two completely different languages in the building, so we want to be able to mix the historic fabric that's there with some of the more modern interiors. The third floor, um, the intent here was to expose the wood framing where we could. Um, we still had to insulate and bring some of the walls up full height um, just to make sure that we could fully enclose the, the building envelope and have a, a good thermal resistance there. Um, but we would sort of create boxes for the offices so that you could see above them and still see the overall volume of the height. When it came to bid day, um, the project came in at total 11.9 million. 
which is obviously much higher than, than anybody expected it to be. Um, when we did that 75% cost check, those were numbers from subcontractors. Um, when it went out to bid, those numbers increased. Um, we did include a line item for the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Um, we also still have an, a 5% owner contingency in here that are contrib contributing to that 11.9 million. Um, but that obviously was much higher than anybody was expecting it to be. Um, we also had just a quick look at the cost of, of the alternates. Um, again, alternate number one was the rear, rear stair tower enclosure. Um, so the base bid was to take off the enclosure that's there, because there's all kinds of water issues, um, and go back with just an open egress stair, which is what it was originally when it was built in the 80s, 70s, 80s, late 70s, early 80s, I think. Um, the ad alternate was going to enclose that stair with a modern envelope so that it was um, uh, fully enclosed and protected from the weather. Alternate number two um, included the slate roof. So again, the base bid is a metal roof, um, which was a more cost-effective product at the time to put on the building. Um, the ad alternate is a slate tile, which is what the building would have had originally. This is one thing that we are trying to get feedback on from the Heritage Council for the tax credits, because um, this may be an area where we can take advantage of, of that additional funding. Alternate number three is the mezzanine. So I don't know how many of you have been up on the third floor. All right, so when you go up to the third floor, there's actually another level above that in that little tower space. Um, it also has a rather scary stair to go up. Um, engineers tell me that it's solid and fine, but I mean, it should not be used for public. There we go. Um, but the thought is, is there, was a, there would be a way to open that up, um, make that usable as a part of the mayor's office, and have it um, kind of cut that back from the face of the wall and be able to look down onto the, the mayor's office from up there. Um, the base bid does not do anything with that mezzanine. Uh, the alternate was to include kind of reconfiguring that area to make it usable. And then alternate number four, um, again, the rear patio back here. So you can see the different costs associated with those alternates. So that 11.9 million is just the base bid. Correct? Make sure I'm stating this right. Just the base bid does not include any of these numbers at this time. Um, <clears throat> let me stop before I go to the next option. Let me stop there and see if there are any questions. So this uh, this has this price has gone up this much in in how how much time? We did the seventy five percent cost check in. Um, no, it was late August, early September, and then it went out to bid in November. Um, the bid date had been extended. We had a lot of people um, with some questions and a lot of interest. The bid date actually extended through to January. So the end of January is when we got these costs. So uh, October, November, December, January. so three and a half, four months. We still have difficulty with participation of subcontractors. We did. We had um, two, three, three bid packages, I think, that did not receive any bidders um, originally. So are those numbers so for the three trades or line items that we didn't receive bids, have you plugged in your estimate numbers for those, or have you gotten? I'll, I'll reach out when I okay. get back to you. You got bids. Yep. Got her bids. Okay. Yeah. So this number includes those those bids that were received after the fact, so that we could get a complete picture. And we had to work to get people to participate in those three trades. Yep. Yeah. People were so busy. Yeah. So, <clears throat> how how permanent is this bid number, and for how long? It's uh, 60 days from February 9th, so it's 1st of April. I'd have to count it up, but like April 9th or 10th, somewhere in that range. 
April what? I believe the 10th, 9th or 10th. Okay. <laughs> we got a lot of things to decide this week. Well, that's just scenario one, right? That's just yeah. scenario one. Um, scenario two is looking at the total project, but without the third floor. So um, that includes the site improvements. It includes all of the exterior improvements. It includes modernizing the interior um, up to the second floor. And then we just leave the third floor alone. Um, additional questions we have with this um, for you all to sort of ruminate on. Um, do we still try to include any alternates with that, the slate roof, the rear patio, stuff like that? Um, we were replacing the elevator and replacing the stairs because we were having to redo them to go up to the third floor. So the question is, do we still need to replace the elevator? Do we still need to replace the stairs? I think at one time there had been some issues with the elevator. Um, so that's why that might still be in there. But those are questions that we would have as far as what we would actually need to include um, in this scope, which could vary the cost that I'm about to show you. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. So if we did this total cost um, or total project without the third floor, um, we're looking at 10.9 million. So it saves a million dollars. I think there would still be an opportunity for some additional cost savings in there. Um, and Feel free to, to jump in, guys, with any additional detail. Uh, I think that you know some of the bids, with the way that the project was originally put out to bid, um, it was hard to pull some of those numbers apart because it was you know holistically structure or holistically stairs. Um, so th those th those two options that you're showing our worst case scenarios on the numbers. We, we feel there's some opportunities for savings uh, on, on both. Uh, part, of, part of the reason for the participation is this is a tough project, uh, number one. And there were some questions on alternates of whether we were just doing exterior and scope and whatnot, if we could kind of get, we're trying to show you worst case scenario here where we could possibly get some direction from the council, say, all right, which path, can you pick one of these three options and we'll run with it and try to get the, the numbers down. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, to clean up things and clear up things for the bidder so we can get some more bidder participation and get some better, uh, get some money cut out of this thing. So you say possible savings on both, what does that mean? How much? That means, uh, there's a, for instance, <clears throat> steel work. So in our original budget, we had less than $200,000 Three bidders bid this steel work within five thousand, well, five to fifteen thousand dollars apart at almost six hundred thousand. So once we dug into it and really saw how much shoring is involved and how hard and difficult it is to get this steel into the building and get it erected, because mm -hmm. you can't bring it in with a crane like you would initially above. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of means and methods, if you will, that once people started actually coming, I mean, I don't know how many times Eddie had to walk us through the building, and these bidders started going up in the attic spaces and actually looking at it, that they saw how difficult it was. So, you know, with removing this third floor work and, and even fine tuning some of this stair tower work and, and other work, and they know that that scope is gonna happen, that price could definitely uh, decrease. Now, how much? Uh, we're never going to get below the budget number of the nine million that we had up there, nine point two, whatever that was. But but I think there's some savings there for sure. And I might be oversimplifying, but the way that it was explained to me when we kind of reviewed the bids when they came in was the more alternates and the more uncertainty of direction you have in a project, the higher the bids are always going to be. It just, we're always going to cover themselves. It, it spooked. It spooked the bidders. They ran from it. 
because we got to give them some clarity so we can get you some better numbers. I mean, that's just, it is what it is. It, it spooked them. I'm not going to fool with this when I'm looking at all these alternates. When I can go over here to this Greenfield project and I know this is what I'm doing. So we've got to give these guys some better clarity so we can give them uh, some better direction and get you some better numbers. Well, what really, you yeah. know, the, the alternate five was exterior work only for this job. So a good portion of these bidders that we've been working with for months, they see that and they're, they are just left because a lot of their work was interior work. So mm -hmm. they'd spent all this time and allocated their resources, you know, breaking the job down and estimating it and then thought that was the route. You know, why would that come out last minute in their minds? This is how they're thinking. And I've talked with them and that's what they told me. So that it scared a lot of people off. Elizabeth, yes. on, on option one and option two, yep. what's what's the time frame to construct the complete? Fifteen time months. Frame? Fifteen months. Fifteen months. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, again, looking at the cost of alternates on here, obviously alternate number three for the mezzanine comes out. We still want to consider the others. Um, they're here as part of the package. Um, so the third option is exterior only. Um, knowing that we have limestones falling off the building, that you know it's potentially a public safety. Uh oh. Oh. Uh, ow. Is it? There you go. Flip. Uh, it's sinking. I didn't even touch anything. <coughs> Just don't have good luck. It's the building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stand very still. Knowing that there are some things that need to be addressed, what we did was looked at exterior only. Um, so again, that's the front improvements because that's all about how you come into the building and it's the ADA ramp and, and everything. Um, it's all the exterior repairs, the stone, the masonry, replacing the windows, replacing the roof, um, and restoring some of those original window openings. The alternates to consider then are the rear patio, the slate roof, and the rear stair enclosure because those are all still exterior elements. The question is, you know, if we're pulling all the interior stuff out of the scope, th then does that allow us to focus on some of these exterior alternates that may or may not be the way to go? Again, particularly with the slate roof and taking advantage of those extra tax credits. Um, and that rear stair enclosure, you know, where is that on the priority list for you all? So the roof, can it be, it is the choice between slate and the metal roof? Yes, ma'am. And the slate is much more expensive. The slate is more expensive. The ad for that was, um, I think, around $475,000. So four yeah, that's four that's 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 That could be a potential tax issue with the tax credit. Yeah. Yes, which is why we're trying to get feedback from the Heritage Council. So how much would that offset you know, from the tax credits? Do you, in other words, you get more of the tax credit if it, it is a slate roof, yeah, which correct. goes back to the to original. Pay for it. Correct. That's the intent of the tax credits to help pay for things like help pay for restoring the slate roof. Would it make a difference between metal and slate? That's what I'm recalling. Yeah, we're just waiting to hear what their feedback is going to be on that. It's about generally 20% tax credit, though, 20%. right? 20%. On the four hundred and seventy something. <coughs> right. mm -hmm. That's the max you'll get is twenty percent of your project cost, your qualifying project cost. So it has to meet the historic standards. So if like these are the number, if it's a ten million dollar project but only eight million or seven million of that qualifies as historic, that's the number that your twenty percent is. Okay. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Right. So it could be a linchpin for the whole thing. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. So what's the total cost for just outside exterior doing the the slate roof and the the what did you call it? The that? masonry. So the, the total cost for um, the exterior is three point five million and some change. Um, I'm sorry, that's just the um, subtotal. Three point eight million and some change once you add in the alternate. The um, well that adds in the fees, mm -hmm. but I think that. Um, the FF and E should not be in there, and it is not factored into that 3.8. Um, we just need to update that slide. The, uh, yeah, it's the cost of the slate roof is um, I'm sorry, it's 494 yeah, so. for that. So it would be the 3.8 plus the 494 for the slate roof. 
less than less than five hundred thousand. Less than well, well, but the five hundred isn't actually factored into that three point eight. The three point four plus the sixty nine thousand plus the hundred and four thousand plus the hundred and seventy four thousand is where it gets you to three point eight. So that that five hundred thousand while showing up in this slide is not factored into that cost. Okay. I will fix that and resend it to you. Resend it out. So three point eight plus four nine four does the whole outside with the alternate. With, with the slate roof alternate. With the slate roof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So I have a question. If we just did the exterior, mm -hmm. like we've got up here, yes. would that take care of all of the water issues which we have? Or are some of our water issues, as far as you can tell, also interior? Like I just went to the bathroom and it looks like that stall is about to float away. With, I mean, the wall is literally peeling away from water. It's moisture. It, it would take care of a lot of them. There are still um, there are still some things that would need to be done on the interior that are related to that. For instance, um, I I we would still recommend up on the third floor. Whereas we even though we are not doing anything up there, um, all along that parapet wall along this wall here, water has gotten down into there, and mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of efflorescence on the brick and so um, we would recommend uh, if we can trying to repoint some of that and get all of that water tight so even though we fix the roof and fix the coping and all that stuff if we don't also fix right. the problems with the brick <clears throat> on the inside yeah. you know it's going to continue to get worse so there is still a little bit of, of work on the interior that we need to be done to help remediate some of those issues um, the same would be true over here in the restrooms and, and what about I know we have some electrical issues um, this wouldn't include any, like you plug something in in this office and you blow the fuse over here. It would not. It would not address any of the mechanical and electrical issues that are currently in the building. Um, the one thing we would have to work through is because we also proposed um, some lighting on the exterior of the building. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, um, I'm looking over at you engineers, not sure um, how much of that we would still be able to do given the existing electrical panels and, and issues and stuff like that that are in the building. We should be able to accommodate that. Um, you know, we may try to make the most out of every opportunity, and those are low-powered LED lights yeah. uh, to complement the architecture and, and accentuate uh, City Hall. So uh, we mm -hmm. minimal uh, electrical load, so we should be able to uh, make that happen if, if that's the choice. And one more question. What about mold? Have you found evidence of mold. I'm trying to make the building safe right. and structurally sound. Well, that's my question, because I'm like, I'm new to all this. Yeah. And I'm like, is the building safe and structurally sound? If we had Maybe to go you. on the, the third option, I still don't want mold. I don't want water continuing to mm. erode, and the outside structure has to. Right. So structurally, and Brian, feel free to weigh in. I mean, structurally, the building is sound. Um, we obviously have water issues that we have to, to fix, and a lot of that with um, replacing the windows and replacing the roof and tightening up, doing some of the repointing, tightening up the caps all along the, the top of the parapets, that will all help. Mm -hmm. um, there are things, like I said, inside that we would need to do with some of the repointing and look at, you know, investigating some of these issues in the restrooms um, that seem to be getting worse. I do think the exterior work would alleviate a lot of that. But there's probably still some more that needs to be done um, on the interior to, to fully address all of that. Elizabeth, to pick up on just the structure issues, what she said, the structure is sound. There are a few issues going on. Like the third floor is not intended for public access right now. So it's not structurally adequate for public use, but there's not access up there. The rear stair area is structurally okay at the moment but it is rapidly deteriorating there's rusted studs back there you can see them that's going to continue to deteriorate at a rapid pace and in our industry is kind of not considered considered non-structural but i want to mention it the, the stone's falling off the front of the building so yeah. that's not your structure collapsing that's your veneer falling apart right um but that but that is an issue so the bones of your structure of your building are sound there's ancillary things that are in need of repair that are semi-structurally related, but not necessarily an unsafe, about to fall down type structure. But that brings us back to if we do just the exterior, 
um, do we want to try to give some priority to that alternate for the rear stair enclosure to make sure that that stays watertight and you know which will not only make sure that when you go out that stair that you stay warm and dry um, but will also help you know protect this face of the building um, from from the issues that you currently have what was the cost on that alternate stair four hundred seventy eight thousand five hundred and eighty eight dollars and now, I believe, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, that is for the entire enclosure. If we do the enclosure without the third floor, you're gonna take a floor off of that. So there's some modifications to that um, cost-wise. Elizabeth, does the exterior only include the site work, the new ADA ramp up It front. does include the front site work. So the, the new um, stair and ramp off of the front, it does not so include the back up. unless we want to put back in there. But nothing in, in the back, you mean the, what's in the back? Now? The patio, so, um, okay, okay. yeah, the patio that's out there and kind okay. of creating that nook for the, the enclosure uh, for, the, for the dumpster and stuff. Okay. Well, and I, I wanna speak to the councilwoman's comment about making it safer, because that's, that's very important. Um, interior we're also adding a fire suppression system a sprinkler system where you're only partially sprinkled right now as well as the upgraded lighting the ada accessibility uh, for your restrooms the new ha hvac system to help with some of the environmental issues so you know that interior work you know it, it does communicate to the inside as well with, with those safety factors all right i'm a little slow it, there's a lot of information. It is a lot of information. Around. <coughs> Option three. Yes. $3.8 million. Yes, sir. What does that include on the veneer? Does that, can, is that taking everything it down is, and rebuilding it or it, only the hot spots that are trouble areas? It is, we've identified all of the hot spots. So it includes repairing those areas, repointing what we could see, um, uh, reattaching elements that needed to be reattached. It does include um, all of the kind of metal cornice work. Um, it includes replacing all of the windows and it includes repointing, um, I believe a certain percentage of the brick that's along this face, the back face and that face of the building as well. Um, Which we would focus on the higher levels of the building. Correct. <coughs> but it does not include the, the enclosure or the slate roof. Correct. Which is another $900,000. Yes, Okay. <laughs> Roughly. Again, there are some, if we don't do the third floor, then that stair tower gets shorter and, and there, you know, there will be some additional savings in there. We just need to work through those details. So will there be any upgrades in HVAC or electrical or any, nothing like that? It would not. Just some things on the bathrooms and stuff? Correct. Okay. Limited. One more question. Yes. I know you've been... Nothing. Nothing in the bathroom. You've spent a significant <coughs> amount of time in this building over the last five or six years now? Yes. The cost on option one obviously has gone quite a bit higher. It has. Is any of that based on inflation or is it all based on just the scope of the work? Um, on, that, 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 on the increase. And you guys may be able to speak to it a little bit. I, I think, to be honest, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, okay. um, I, I think some of it's the inflation, certainly. Um, I think some of it is everybody, all, all of the, the subcontractors are super busy right now and they, they just don't need the work. I think this is um, a complex project it's, it's certainly part of the reason why we love it because we like complex projects um, but it can tend to scare people away or just throw high numbers at it because they aren't sure what to expect um, certainly with renovations you might always uncover something and so there's always sort of a padding factor in there um, because you never know what you're going to uncover and you just want to make sure that you're covered with your work um, for whenever you rip something out and find something you did not expect, which always happens. Is there anything you guys want to right. add? But option three, it's my understanding, does not do anything to the inside of this building. Correct. Yeah, we were talking about the walls. 
in the restrooms. <coughs> the, that, I think that, that was what your comment was. We, we were talking about the water coming in. The water coming in, but it does not fix the existing damage to the, the existing yeah. damage. Okay, right. yeah. yeah, and I mean, it, for any council members, I know we asked who's been to the third floor. For any council members who want to go to the third floor, Eddie will take you. But not just the third floor, because I know that that part of the project is probably, that's that's the most fun part of the project, but it's, a, it's an easy part to cut out. But if you've not been to the basement either, I think I think it's important for council as, as you decide on this to, you know, we used to house code enforcement and building inspection in the basement, mm -hmm. and we moved them out of there because we perceived it to be a very uh, unfortunate kind of not unhealthy healthy place to work. Um, and I, I think that's a legitimate concern. I know our clerks are at the Roth House now, and they've reported fewer headaches. Um, so it's not asking about it's, mold. It's legitimate, um, yeah. but but while considering this, kind of just touring the building, asking questions about existing staffing. I know that Chief Thompson talked about the fire station four conversation, uh, accommodating for the fact that we're not done growing. Um, we are we're we're about to bring in our director of affordable housing and homelessness and find where to put her so those are all the kinds of things that please be considering ask those questions of the mayor about his current staff and what he thinks uh, needs are and kind of assess the building on your own to make that decision like I said we can absolutely facilitate that and um, we'll make sure to get all the actual design um, <coughs> plans out to you all so you can see <coughs> what's proposed and what you think uh, is doable can I can I throw something out there totally just blow this out. <laughs> we got three alternatives. <clears throat> Have we thought about a fourth being exterior and first floor? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Enlarge the council chambers? We have not looked at that as a cost option. We certainly can. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I think, <coughs> not that it is impossible to do, once we start coming into the interior like that, then the question becomes with the building systems, with the mechanical electrical systems. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you leave it as is? Do you upgrade it? How do you upgrade it? How do you right. put in enough to, yeah. so that you can expand it in the future? Are you gonna end up spending more that way? Um, and I don't know, again, you guys feel free to jump in. I don't know that there's a good like start stop point for that. I think also with expanding um, council chambers, we have to take our vault out. See, see, Brian, I know enough. <laughs> there were, the expansion of the council chambers to the level we did required substantial reconstruction of the second floor. So oh, to wow. do this to the council chambers almost requires the renovation of the second floor above the council chambers. Oh, to, to, to do it at the level that we did. My, my thought, and you know, I've, I've mentioned this to other, uh, a couple other council members, is you know, not take the whole wall out there. Take but, out less. But take out less and make that an overflow. Yes. Basically. To cut the cost down that way. At, we would basically leave the vault. Yes, you to, leave the vault, to, to make like, like a, a pass through, yeah. and we could put large TVs over there for overflow, but be able to have people come into this area if, if they had the comments to council or, or something. Yeah. Right. The, the, right, that would, I think that would, you know, that, no, that, that is absolutely viable and that yeah. would not require redoing the second right. floor. And so that's, that that's, what my, that's what my thoughts are. Yeah. But then you still have your questions of systems? Yes, that's, I understand that. I understand so that. if you do that, you know, the start and the stop point, and, and, uh, and even if you go to option three, right. what concerns us a little bit if and when you ever renovate this building is what you would have to tear out mm -hmm. on the exterior to be able to redo systems on the interior. Yeah, but wouldn't that be covered in your owner contingencies as far as if something else came up? I'm, I'm talking if you do the Exterior, help me out. Trying to get steel in the building, for instance, after yeah. the fact, or try, you know, you're any material. Not, di uh, not wanting to affect what's been fixed on the outside mm -hmm. to come in later and do the inside. That's that's what. Yeah, like five or six years from now, if we wanted to 
Just perfect. Yeah. yeah. Just something to think about. Yeah. But I just want to throw that idea out there you know, to everyone and, and to see what <coughs> you know, it's something else to think about. Sure. You know, I mean, we're, we're dealing with, you know, what did I see, 55 back there on capacity. Mm -hmm. I mean, our for the past four months, we've had probably 100 plus people in our in our council meetings. And, sure. You know, I just think we need to prepare for something like that for the future. Well, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the existing the existing design as is, the plans, assuming we had unlimited funds, would both extend council chambers and would create an overflow room. Am I making that up? Was there not a, a way we could set up an overflow room? There was a potential for the training room on the ground floor to be that kind of overflow that we could set monitors up. The there. Maybe right. Right. So, I mean, Different, different opportunity that you're describing the same concept. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I just want to throw that out there. No, I mean that that's definitely a good thought, and part of what tonight is about is yeah. going through the options that we have, and is there something else that we need to, to take a look at? Is 11.9 million a hard number? It, it yeah. is until April 10th. 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 <coughs> gotcha. Yes. Um, so this is just a quick look and quick comparison of um, all three options for the total project, the total project without the third floor, and then for the exterior only. Again, those are the kind of base bid numbers. So those do not include the alternates for the slate roof or the exterior enclosure or anything like that. But on the, the third one, the 3.8 million, that also does not include any upgrades in our HVAC electrical or anything. No. So are all three of those scenarios subject to the conversation about having direction and being able to whittle down some of those figures? I mean, you say hard numbers. Yeah, that's that's what we have right now. But if, if at the next council meeting, council said, all right, option two, we, we are committed to this. We want you to go back to these subs. We want you to sharpen your pencil. And we want to, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of a, a decrease you could foresee, but all three scenarios could see a, a decrease in total project cost with better direction. Your, your, fir your first two certainly could okay. see a decrease. That third one's pretty daggone tight. Okay. I mean, we have to be quite upfront with you. He, he would have liked to have thrown a half million dollars in fluff on that third option. Okay. Because you're going to want to, to your point about the bathroom walls, right. you're going to want to come do some of those types of things. So that option three is tight. Options one and two have some room in them. I want to make that perfectly clear. That is all that we have. I don't have anything else to show, but I don't know if anybody has any <laughs> more questions or if anybody wants to go back and take a look at anything else. Or if you have sat here long enough. So number done. two, option two, total project 10.9. No third floor, up to 15 months, and there's room in that to come down. Yes, ma'am. But the same with option one, there's room yes. in that to come Yes, down. sir. With the potential to cover 20% of the repair cost. Correct. Yes, sir. And, and that's, that's with the slate roof. No. no. Well, we, we don't know. Okay. We don't know if we have to do the slate roof. Okay. To they, they, may the they may not make us do it. They may not make you do it. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it would okay. be, it, it, yeah. that's why we had hoped to get some, that's why we submitted early, because we had hoped to get some feedback um, on those tax credits and what they would be focusing on. But you probably will in the next, before our next council meeting, they could be emailed. That's what Devin. the hope is. We were okay. going back and forth with them right. um, today, and we're trying to send them a list of um, specific items that we'd like them to review and get us some initial feedback by hopefully early next week. Okay. Be honest with you, we've been passed around over there three times. <laughs> it's had different people, uh, new people. You're passed around. Yeah. It's not fun. Yeah. It, we, yeah. That's just rude. Can't, can't, can't. Ellen, you, on, on the tax credit conversation, no. you know, you all identified. <coughs> say it was 100 million was their pool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they are understaffed, so we have uh, yes. we've experienced that uh, as well. And once it goes to Shippo, it's you just cross your fingers and hope you hear back. But this is. This pool, and that's why I hope that we can find a creative way to capture these funds, this is about as robust as the tax credit pool is ever going to be. Yeah. Or has ever been. It's a situation yeah. where um, you're almost, 
Knock on wood. If you don't use, you're it, almost you're, entirely guaranteed to get your to get your twenty percent of your project. If right. you don't so, use it, you lose it. Yeah. So I mean, that's something that's obviously there are a lot of high numbers here, but there are a lot of positives to look into. We've obviously invested a lot in this project, and you know, it's it's complicated. And so um, I know I'm going to send these resources out to you all. I'm going to. Uh, we we budgeted. Stacy reminded me we budgeted 10.3 for this project to date. So that's currently accounted for in fiscal year 22-23 budget. Um, so that's that's the number right now, and obviously any anything that is achieved in tax credits would be deducted from that. But um, I'll send the presentations out, and if as you come into questions, obviously, and uh, Stacy and I and Eddie are in good contact uh, with the architects and and their team and the construction manager team. So <coughs> please send those to us. Obviously. Um, no decisions tonight, but a lot to think about. And Devin, I'll fix a couple of these things just to make sure it's super clear, and we'll send it to you um, this evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very Thank much. You very Thank much. you. Very Thank much. you all. Thank you. Thank you for around for the fire park, too. Oh, yeah. I know we'll see you guys. Okay. Oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>